Also, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back again in the second day of uh, Casos Annual Workshop, Digital Twins and Complex Systems. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Thomas Neumuth, who is going to talk about digital patient twins and model-based medicine. Professor Neumuth is an engineer and computer scientist. Uh, his research interests focus on model-based medicine, smart biomedical technology, and situation-aware medical information systems. He is a technical director of the Innovation Center Computer Assisted Surgery, ICCAS, at the Medical Faculty of the University of Leipzig. He is heading the Research Division Model-Based Medicine of ICCAS, with currently five research groups. So please join me in welcoming Professor Neumut. Thank you very much, Wildan, for the kind introduction. Thank you very much uh, also for the invitation to the organizers. And yeah, I'm happy to present you the talk on digital, digital twins and model-based medicine. Let's start sharing my screen. Okay, and hope it works. At least in the okay, thank you very much. So uh, please let me allow some uh, words about the background of our institution. Um, so my name is Thomas Neumut, uh, already introduced me. I'm the technical head uh, of the institute. Uh, the name is uh, Innovation Center Computer Assisted Surgery. It's a more or less uh, like historic uh, name. Uh, it has surgery inside. We started with surgery with uh, technology development for operating rooms. Uh, the institute was uh, established uh, approximately 15 years ago, and we have since then rapidly grown uh, based on the let's say high interest of uh, uh, digitalization and personalization uh, of medical technologies. Uh, and we are now approximately 100 people. Um, we are organized in uh, five different main uh, research uh, divisions, so to say. So we have uh, colleagues that develop uh, medical technology and medical communication technologies. So how can we enable biomedical devices to share their data, to share data across vendor boundaries, uh, to, to combine uh, systems uh, to, to uh, let's say, to, to greater systems, to uh, systems that are more comprehensive and that enable a true networking of uh, medical functions. Then we have a second group uh, uh, organized uh, around the digital twin topics and uh, model-based medicine. That's also the topic I will present today uh, in a more depth. And then we have some specific groups dedicated to sensor development, for instance, uh, imaging tech, medical imaging technologies or therapeutic uh, technologies, like you can see here, robots, uh, uh, medical robots, and uh, then also a group dedicated to enable medical technology to be more mobile simply because currently it's everything or most medical technology is focused uh, on hospitals. Uh, and we see here a room for improvements in the future. Uh, today, uh, I would like to discuss with you to, to introduce here is uh, the, how we see, or how we envision the role of uh, medical, uh, of model-based uh, medicine and the digital twins, the digital patient twins as one or maybe as the major component of this uh, technology field. So generally, uh, healthcare is changing in a dramatic way currently we will see a whole bunch of new uh, even new function even new medical functions in the future so this uh, i listed uh, some of the main uh, let's say paradigms uh, for for the introduction so from for instance we shift currently from uh, a disease focus uh, of of treatment to a more patient centered care so the the individualized uh, the indi individual patient is going more and more in the middle and in the focus of the of the health management. Um, so we uh, healthcare is moving from uh, uh, let's say uh, a, a repair approach to a more uh, preventive approach. So currently 
uh, if you see a doctor, usually you already have a problem uh, you want to have uh, to, to get fixed. And uh, this is in the future uh, changing or will change dramatically as medicine will develop in a way uh, that we try to detect, early detect and to prevent that you develop the problem you uh, are currently going to the doctor, for instance. So that means uh, to to prevent diseases, to to uh, early detect uh, diseases, this will be a fundamental uh, new paradigm coming in the future. And then we have uh, the the data availability and data sharing, not only inside of uh, a hospital, of hospitals, for instance, uh, but also across. So we call it the sectors, uh, from hospitals to to the doctors in the land side, and from the uh, from the doctors to the rehabilitation uh, unit so all uh, units uh, will be networked and are able to exchange uh, data with each other about you as a patient of course uh, data exchange under your full control so modern technology modern medicine is not uh, possible without uh, using technology no longer so every state of the art uh, treatment is uh, supported by technical systems either biomedical technology or uh, medical informatics, computer science technologies, uh, for instance, even the, if you think about uh, electronic patient records documenting the, the work uh, performed at the, at the patient. Uh, for, for those of you that are not that not familiar with the medical domain, there's, there's a, the slogan called 4P medicine, I tried to, to put it here. Uh, uh, it's uh, 4P medicine means that medicine gets more personalized. I already mentioned this, so more uh, dedicated to the individual patient. The predictive uh, uh, component will be extended very much. So that means that you uh, increase uh, efforts of simulation of therapies or uh, uh, try to, to predict the outcome of a, of a uh, working step. Uh, for healing the patient before you even ad admi administer the drug or the, the procedure. Preventive medicine, I already mentioned, so trying to prevent diseases and participatory, um, it uh, relates to, uh, um, to ways uh, to enable the patient uh, more and more to participate in the decision-making process. So we have a lot of different uh, opportunities um, that can, uh, for instance, of treatments that can be applied to the patient. And here, uh, the patient should be able to uh, make an informed consent and to participate in the decision process. So what are, are our uh, challenges? If we try to, to support all these uh, new paradigms uh, by, by technology, then we have uh, to understand how clinical decision-making, uh, for instance, is uh, performed. Um, so clinicians are... Uh, are confronted with a large amount of clinical literature and uh, guidelines. So there's a growing uh, number, an ever-growing number of uh, studies, of publications, and ideally, the individual uh, doctor should be should try to to keep up to date and to in order to make an, uh, the best decision for the patient. And then we have a very important point: medicine is uh, a kind of let's say. Uh, a signs of uncertainty. Uh, so there is always, uh, there is no yes or no, uh, or very, in very rare conditions, there's a yes or no about the decision. There are always uh, probabilities. And uh, this is uh, also something that is, uh, influences the design of uh, technical aids, for instance. Then uh, we have a lot of uh, different sources where data can come from for our medical twins, uh, for our uh, digital twins. And uh, all this together brings us in a very complex environment, a very knowledge intensive uh, uh, environment, and also uh, poses a lot of challenges for the clinician. So how, how we envision the digital patient models, the digital twins uh, to uh, support the current relation of a patient and, uh, and the physician, a doctor, for instance. So uh, this is a more or less traditional relation uh, between them, both of them. And we see this digital twins as a third component here. Um, this third component captures and stores, organizes and analyzes um, on the one hand the, the medical knowledge 
uh, that is in, usually inside of the head of the patient, uh, of, the, of the doctor. I will bring an example later. And uh, also uh, is an, a mean to share the knowledge, to store the knowledge and to perform and support the, for instance, automatic or semi-automatic execution of this uh, knowledge or of strategies. If you think uh, about, uh, uh, let's say, connecting digital twins with uh, surgical robots, for instance, that uh, uh, physicians uh, show the model uh, a line where a, a cut needs to be set and then the robot performs it at the same uh, line, for instance. So um, the patient is connected with the digital twins, of course, with sensors and actorics. It's more or less the same as in, in, in other industries here. Uh, but also we need to have a strong uh, access or a strong, to, to put strong emphasis of the access of the physician to the uh, digital model because the physician needs to take the responsibility of the correctness of the data and the, the uh, application of the data. So we need to enable him to find a good access and to, to, verify, to be able to verify uh, the, the procedures and the decisions uh, made by the, the models or in, let's say in the virtual world. And this is uh, what we call the model-based uh, medicine, so to say, because medicine is extended with this uh, third component here. And uh, this is well, how we see, how we envision the, the future. Okay, so I think the concept of digital twin uh, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone in this, uh, every speaker has it in his presentation. So simply we, we understand the digital twins of patients as a virtual representation of the, of the um, patient in the, in the virtual world uh, that corresponds with a physical representation with the real patient in the real world. And uh, both are updated and synchronized by information flows. What are our challenges here? Uh, so the first, uh, the first situation is that we have in medicine a lot of, uh, on the one hand, a lot of uh, quite heterogeneous uh, data sources. And on the other hand, these data are very less structured sometimes. So we have uh, uh, data that are scattered across multiple healthcare providers. So imagine if you uh, visit, the if you have a problem and you visit your doctor and the doctor refers you to the to the hospital uh, for uh, surgery, for instance, and then afterwards you go to a rehabilitation uh, unit, then usually each of these three units, the doctor, the hospital, and the rehabilitation unit, uh, gather their own data about you uh, and don't share them. Or they only share very condensed abstracts of this data, like a discharge report, for instance, uh, if you leave the, the hospital. And everything else is uh, scattered uh, data that are not uh, at the current stage, uh, not uh, combined uh, for you as a patient uh, and uh, that are not also not usable uh, in the current way. So uh, then inside of the, of the uh, healthcare providers, if, for instance, inside of the hospital, so we have a lot of different modalities uh, that uh, participate in the patient treatment uh, process. Uh, for instance, so we have all the radiology uh, devices, we have the anesthesia or monitoring devices and so on. Uh, and even they don't share uh, and integrate their data. They all report, they, they all document, and but they all uh, store these data in different systems. And uh, so this, the situation even gets worse if you have uh, third party uh, participants in the situation such as specialized labs that uh, uh, analyze your histology uh, or your cell situation, uh, whatever. So we have a, a quite limited number also of uh, uh, data communication uh, protocols in medicine. Uh, there are mainly two main uh, communication uh, standards that Psycom and HL7 uh, that uh, are able to, 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 that can be used to share data, but it's still a quite messy situation. Um, so the government currently tries to change this situation. So we have now since I think four years, the Med medical informatics initiative. Uh, this is uh, an initiative supported with, uh, I think uh, about 100 million euros that cares about this problem uh, and that thinks about how to enable data exchangeability and interoperability in, for hospitals in the current stage. 
and we hope that the system uh, that this situation will change in the future the second main challenge we have is medical knowledge formalization so uh, also here the information uh, about the medical knowledge are not easy to access so we have uh, uh, also scattered guidelines we have guidelines for every uh, from every uh, professional society of clinicians every the society has different guidelines the guidelines are in different stages development stages and uh, uh, most of all many of the guidelines or most of the guidelines are even in uh, yeah text form in prosa form so there is no structure nothing that can really be used without uh, let's say higher algorithmic work to, in, to teach a computer system how to use these guidelines, for instance. And then, uh, but on the other hand, we have the situation that there are often internet, interdisciplinary teams that uh, should work together to treat a patient. And here I have an example for you. This is a, uh, maybe just a quick introduction. This is a, a, a called a tumor board situation. A tumor board is a kind of uh, more or less standardized meeting where uh, clinicians from different uh, disciplines sit together and discuss uh, the treatment of a specific patient. Let's say of me, uh, um, if I would be a subject to a cancer treatment in, in, inside of a hospital, then there's a board deciding uh, what is the best therapy for me. And that's, let's say this, uh, this meeting is called a tumor board. And the problem with the tumor board is uh, uh, the good thing, uh, the advantage is that uh, you have uh, participants from different uh, clinical disciplines here. And this advantage is, is that even the, these participants of the dis from the different clinical disciplines have different uh, experiences and uh, different understanding of, uh, the, uh, of me as a patient. So we try to visualize it. So let's say here's the doctor who's uh, gathering information, he's reading the information, and then he creates an image about the patient inside of, the, of his, his head. This image is influenced by his uh, experience, this is influenced, of course, by his interpretation of the data. It's influenced if, it, if he is a, a senior, senior doctor, if he is a resident, and so on. And of course, about his background. So if he is a surgeon, and then the guy next to him uh, is uh, let's say radiologist, then they they have roughly they watching at the same object uh, or subject in this case on, on my data, but they have different uh, slightly different understanding, um, and that's uh, we try to visualize here with this graph, and each of them has a different view but on the same thing. And what we try to uh, create with the digital twin is a combined representation uh, about the patient of all. Uh, these uh, different uh, views, and so that's uh, well, how we see uh, how we think that this is the advantage in treating uh, the patient, uh, and how we uh, use it in the future for future applications. So, what are these applications? These are the examples or the first uh, results of a, of a, a project called Models for Personalized Medicine. It was uh, we started the funding in I think 2018. Uh, here, so uh, and uh, so we, here we explore the application of medical twins of digital patient twins during different stages of cancer free treatment in hospitals. So um, we have uh, the different uh, stages. Of course, we have the assessment of the uh, uh, of the day of the patient data by the clinicians. Then we have the discussions here. It's called the, we call it the interdisciplinary decision support. It's the tumor board. Then, of course, we need to inform the patient. We, uh, the patient needs to be able to participate in the decision-making process. And then uh, we have the therapy. Uh, so this is uh, roughly the different stages here. And we created a digital twin technology uh, in the background that is used for all these different uh, stages uh, of the, yeah, let's call it the, the patient journey in the hospital. This is also a, a, a project uh, with, where we have uh, a number of companies involved. This is uh, mainly uh, uh, companies from Saxony, so from Leipzig and from Dresden, that uh, support our project here by providing different technologies. So uh, how does it look like? 
uh, the project core is uh, simply by linking uh, the, the data available about the patients uh, on a semantic way, a semantic interpretation. Uh, but not only the data, but also uh, the formalized linking this data with formalized clinical knowledge. So from so we uh, formalize the clinical guidelines uh, to make them uh, machine interpretable and to include them into the um, yeah into the model interpretation uh, process. We also uh, use data from different uh, uh, devices. Uh, you know you can imagine that during the patient treatments, uh, you have a lot of uh, devices, especially for tumor treatment uh, that participate in the patient journey. So you have all the radiology uh, uh, information from the big uh, imaging machines, then you have lab results, then you have also, but you have also information about the psychosocial states of the patient, uh, uh, the, the pain scores and everything, and this needs to be included and modeled and also updated. So uh, some requirements uh, we set before we uh, can use these uh, models or we want to develop it. So the first one, uh, we designed it as a single point of access uh, system. So uh, because um, we need to uh, uh, provide a single objective was to, pro to provide a, a unique interface uh, for all the applications that uh, consume this data uh, to, to address, to talk to. Uh, then we had uh, reasoning up and uh, on the fly for the data. Uh, this was uh, very important for us because we, we cannot pre-process every request or the, the response to every request here. And we need to, to enable uh, uh, in fast uh, reasoning and in time decisions uh, to, to, to uh, yeah, design a proper response. Then of course, uh, we focus on the modular architecture. Uh, so seamless integration, possibility for seamless integration of different decision-making uh, 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 and uh, uh, machine learning applications uh, for specific uh, single, singular uh, tasks. And very important, uh, uh, also the modular architecture was uh, a focus for us that we are able to uh, yeah, validate uh, the single modules because, uh, you know, medical domain is uh, uh, subject to medical uh, regulations, uh, to, to uh, medical affairs and regulatory affairs uh, uh, topics. And uh, in the long run, if you want to develop a technology, it needs to be uh, comply uh, with medical uh, device regulations, for instance. So, and then also some, some other uh, uh, requirements. I have one slide with a, a short look, let's say, on the inside. You see here on the top, uh, we have the, the patient journey. It's the, the green boxes uh, of you have different, the patient in, inside of the bed of, on the left-hand side. And you have different applications that uh, are applied to the patient uh, during the treatment. The core uh, is, uh, we have the two engines. The first one is that we call the, the digital medical twin access engine. Uh, this engine uh, provides the, the interface, the unique in interfaces uh, for the applications, so that the applications can retrieve data and also ask for um, yeah, calculation uh, tasks and uh, whatever. Uh, and then we have another uh, engine that cares about the representation. As I mentioned, it's very important to provide uh, for the, an access for the clinical user to be able to validate uh, his hypothesis or his decision and to verify uh, or to check if the, if the system is uh, already, let's say, working in a proper way. Then we have uh, two other blue boxes on the bottom. So we have the models, model-based services, so segmentation, classification, prediction, so everything that can needs to be done with the, with the data uh, uh, of the patient. And uh, then, of course, we have a, a knowledge base about the computerized representation of medical knowledge, let's call it this way. Uh, data come from uh, bottom left, from the, from, from the, from the technical, uh, from the databases. Uh, so as I mentioned before, so we have a lot of different databases, uh, even inside one uh, of one hospital or one organization where the data are scattered, scattered uh, and we need to connect them and um, yeah, retrieve uh, uh, them on the fly. 
uh, it was not definitely not our uh, objective to to uh, create a, another data store, uh, another warehouse uh, uh, that runs in parallel to the existing data sources, uh, because uh, on the one hand it's simply not it's really hard to handle, uh, and it takes uh, uh, additional effort to keep this uh, up to date, and so we directly access the patient data in in our hospital. Okay, uh, and now I have uh, three uh, uh, demo applications. Uh, just uh, uh, at, at the end of the presentation, there's uh, a short outlook uh, what we did. So the first one, uh, as I mentioned, so we have the uh, smart environment for the tumor board, where we can where the clinicians can uh, access the different patient data and uh, verify the decisions and uh, also document the decisions that are done in the tumor board. Then we have uh, an, uh, we also call it a pilot app, um, a way on how to educate the patient. So because uh, if the patient needs to, if we need to retrieve patient consent for, for treatment, we need to, to enable the patient to fully understand what is done with him and to, 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 to agree. And also here we use uh, these uh, types of models. Of course, we have also mainly uh, 3D models and uh, dynamic models here. And the last one is uh, that we use this technology to trigger uh, our uh, biomedical technology. Uh, so I, I, I talked uh, through uh, the presentation mainly about the, the digital patient twins, but we also have twins uh, for the digital, for instance, for the processes, for the value adding uh, uh, business process inside of the hospitals, uh, for instance, for, for surgical interventions. And uh, also here we have uh, digital twins of these processes that uh, profit from uh, these infrastructures. And just to give you an understanding how this works, um, this is a, a demo. Uh, uh, operating room we have in our institute. So all the devices here are real medical devices, but with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, manipulated uh, interfaces. Uh, of course, this is not a real patient here in the middle. Uh, and uh, so now we enable the real physical world with the virtual world, and with, the, with the digital twin uh, of this, uh, let's say, operating room and of this business process to interact with each other. And you will see how, uh, what the effects are. So uh, some more uh, background. So the, the intervention you will see is uh, uh, intervention, intervention from uh, ear, nose, uh, throat uh, surgery. So uh, the patient, the, the, the guy playing the doctor is uh, operating inside of the nose. And you will see how the room will adapt to the work steps of the surgeon without any interaction of the search with the technology. So he's uh, taking, for instance, this pointer and automatically the system detects what he wants to do and changes the, the, the main screen to this uh, uh, navigation. So this navigation function is uh, uh, a mean to support orientation of the search inside of the patient body uh, to know where he is and where he should go. Uh, then he measures uh, automatically. Then he's taking uh, this thing is called a speculum. It just keeps the no nostril open. And you see the light automatically adapts to this uh, if he uh, puts it in the nose. Uh, this is important to notify the team that the procedure starts. He takes an endoscope, endoscope is switched off. And as soon as he is going inside of the, uh, of the patient, uh, the camera of the, the light source of the endoscope switches. Uh, starts uh, working and the video stream is uh, linked to the to the main screen. So this is this happens all seamless. So there's no direct interaction of the of this surgeon with the technology, uh, and the technology automatically detects and synchronizes to the real process and adapts. And of course, uh, we have here uh, some some information that, uh, for instance, during the procedure, the, the work steps are reported automatically, are documented. You have a quality check. Uh, so if he, he visits all different uh, nasal cavities, for instance, and if he is approaching, for instance, some sensitive uh, structures such as the brainstem, then he gets additional information. So be careful 
uh, there's a warning. Uh, if you uh, access further or go ahead here, then you end up in the brain. For instance, here you see you get automatically the orientation and next to the brain as you see here. Okay, this is the way how we see, and this is also a nice example to how we see that uh, the digital twin, in this case, uh, one specific representation of the patient uh, here on the screen uh, with the digital twin of the process and the real twin and the real process interact with each other. And that's how we envision uh, medicine will look like in the future. So finally, uh, what's the impact uh, of this uh, technology? What we see as impact uh, of the patient, it's also a kind of summary here. Uh, it, we will increase or it will increase the, the, the topic of precision medicine uh, because it's much easier uh, for the for the uh, treating uh, physician to to orient to to look through a, a currently large amount of data that are less structured uh, uh, and then also to, to perform uh, therapies more specific so uh, just think about uh, the application of uh, surgical robots that are able to perform much more precise uh, cuttings uh, for instance uh, such as uh, surgeons uh, then we have the therapy simulation uh, topic. So if we have a properly designed model of the patient, we can um, use this uh, model to predict the treatment. So this is the way of the predictive medicine. Uh, then digital patient twins we see to be, or we interpret to be ubiquitous. That means they are not linked to a specific place uh, where uh, the for, for patient is treated. So you can simply send a copy of the patient to, uh, to the digital twin to an expert in wherever, in, in Asia or in, 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 in United States to get an impression. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's much easier at least to, to uh, then uh, compared to sending the real patient and much cheaper. And uh, of course, uh, we have some other uh, topics we, we address. Uh, so formalizing the medical knowledge uh, discovering new medical knowledge and including this into the, the workflows. And then also finally, uh, we investigate here uh, options for virtual clinical trials. So clinical trials is still a, a, a large topic, uh, and a very important topic about uh, the regulation uh, uh, scenarios and the regulation uh, requirements. And uh, so these technologies, the, the digital twins in medicine have some potential to contribute uh, to this uh, clinical trials um, technologies and requirements. Okay, and I think I'm more or less in time. Thank you very much for yes, your thank uh, you uh, for your uh, for for listening to the talk. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Neumuth. It's very interesting that uh, we see that the digital twins can advance any, any medical technology in the future. So any other question from, from the audience before uh, I, I ask probably I, if that's not the case that probably I can ask first. Uh, uh, you mentioned before that uh, uh, there is a challenge uh, in 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 collecting the data from from uh, many sources resources uh, um, yeah from many institutions and so on on on, on the others. Um, how do you collect this data? Do you use this uh, kind of relational database um, method, or you you? You use the data storage of a graph theory because uh, we we uh, we assume a patient as an object. Or how, how do you how do you solve this problem and collect this problem as well? So, yeah, yeah we we use uh, a simple uh, relational database with the links to the original data. I see. Okay. Okay. And then this relational database, you mean that uh, you use kind of the process of extract transfer loading process and then it's transferred from the sources to, to, to the database server in, in Leipzig. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the data are already, uh, let's say, residuing in, in, in Leipzig inside of the hospital. 
I and see, you okay. create a small uh, subsystem that it extracts uh, the relevant subset of data from the clinical database. Of course, everything inside of the clinical mm -hmm. network. Uh, uh, so because uh, these were real patient uh, uh, information uh, we, we operated, and uh, but we are part of the of the university hospital and of the medical school, so we had access to this data. I see. Okay. Right. Uh, so there is a question from uh, Artu, probably. Artu, please. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for this fascinating talk. Uh, Ed, that looked very, very cool. Uh, I was wondering, um, in the in the sense of uh, someone similar along the similar lines as as uh, the previous question, uh, with regards to collating data together. Have you also considered some sort of uh, federated uh, approach to, uh, to to improve your uh, digital twins and models, perhaps by co collaborating with uh, other institutions? And the second question, if, if I may, um, with regards to this very, very impressive presentation of a, uh, operating room of the future, uh, I'm wondering what is the fail uh, protection and a fallback option for a surgeon who uh, might encounter some yeah. issues. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, to answer the, the first questions about uh, the, let's say, federated uh, learning uh, approach, uh, we didn't use it here uh, because uh, uh, we focused on the, let's say, relation of the data to each other and to, to provide the, the semantic layer here. Uh, and to discover also the, um, the application of the digital patient twins uh, during the different uh, steps of the patient journey. So during the different treatment uh, stages, so to say. Uh, federated learning uh, is something we see uh, as useful, as very useful if uh, we need to retrieve data for our models that are uh, residing in, in um, let's say different uh, hospitals, uh, for instance. But here uh, you have uh, a completely different uh, type of, let's say, challenges. Uh, if the, then the patient uh, needs to agree or to uh, underline the consent in the, in the uh, third uh, location uh, to, to, to support the data transfer, for instance. And, uh, this is the one, uh, uh, the one point. And the second point is even if the patient has uh, signed the consent, it doesn't mean that there is a technical infrastructure to, to uh, transfer the data between the different uh, participants of the uh, general patient treatment. So these are uh, all, um, let's say, quite large challenges. Uh, the, the challenges are known. They are, they are currently addressed by different programs. Uh, as I mentioned, for instance, the medical informatics initiative uh, um, and uh, but they are not solved yet that's the problem so <laughs> and it will take uh, also uh, maybe two to five years uh, at least to to enable the the main health uh, providing uh, institutions the main hospitals to 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 be able to uh, communicate data to receive data and everything because you need to develop the infrastructure or adapt the existing infrastructure for this new requirement. Uh, and for the second question, so the fallback for the uh, for the operating room that is, uh, let's say, following uh, the, the treatments of the surgeon. So you can imagine this works like um, it works like your uh, your car navigation system, uh, for instance, your your Google uh, what's the name Google navigation uh, the Google Maps function. So this. The system uh, uh, has uh, some sensor information about uh, where it, uh, let's say, concludes your position, and it predicts, uh, it knows your, 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 the, the way you want to go and, and your, your final destination, and then uh, predicts uh, and calculates everything that's on the road to, to the destination. If you decide as, uh, let's say, uh, uh, informed uh, driver, uh, to uh, deviate from the from the road to to make take a break at a tank stop or a petrol station or whatever, <laughs> uh, then the system uh, follows you. It doesn't forces you to stay on the road. 
no, not yet. Maybe it will change sometimes <laughs> with the self-driving cars, uh, but not yet. So, and it's the same situation with the with the operating room. So the the sensors detect the current states of the procedure. They uh, calculate what will happen next, but it doesn't force the surgeon to perform specific work steps because this would also change some very essential, uh, let's say, requirements uh, uh, for this technology uh, because then the technology providers would take responsibility for the medical treatment. And uh, at least our, um, uh, our, our motivation is that this is should not definitely not happen because the last word what's uh, done to the patient should uh, be done by, by by the responsible clinician uh, uh, and at the end so we have currently i mean in, in with the self driving cars we i think the society uh, is already on a good way to 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 accept these technologies i mean this was I think about 10 15 years ago if you heard about first time about the self driving cars, or at least my as oh uh, okay maybe hmm, interesting dangerous whatever yeah but now it's more or less accepted because it was shown in the last years okay it works fine we are still not in this situation in medicine <laughs> and i have strong doubt that we will come to the situation in the next year 10 years in in medicine that uh, uh the society will accept a system that uh, automatically makes decisions and performs this decisions also automatically without a human in the loop uh, that uh, makes a cross check. For sure, for sure. Thanks very much. I absolutely love the uh, comparison to uh, GPS navigation, by the way. I wonder if uh, at some point the, the uh, system will display a warning not to use your phone or text while performing a surgery. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Probably next to there is Frank Dressel from Deutsche Ruf Raumfahrt. Please, question. Yeah, hello. So um, first of all, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a question on uh, slide 12 or 13 or so. You uh, were talking about the uncertain piece, um, aleatoric and epistemic. And my question is, do you model it in the digital twin? And if yes, can you maybe uh, say something about it? Because um, I guess that even that there is something missing or uncertain is especially in medical treatment and extremely important <laughs> information. And it uh, would be very interesting to see how you incorporate it in your models. Yes, yes. So. Um... Yeah, as you uh, completely, you, you are completely right. Medicine is never 100% complete. You never have a full uh, information, uh, a range, full range of information to make a fully informed uh, decision uh, as a clinician. Uh, some, something is uh, always missing, some information, and you need to compensate it. And you need to, let's say, uh, take a look at the big picture uh, and to, to reconstruct or to, to consider maybe the, the empty, the white spots on the, on the, on the map and to reconstruct them. Uh, we do it here uh, uh, by indicating how uh, sure we are uh, for different information entities. So if you have a uh, uh, measured uh, value uh, from, from, uh, from a system uh, that is uh, subject to medical device regulations, such as whatever, uh, a thermometer, a stupid example, but uh, yeah, if you, if you have a value, uh, uh, the, 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 you, the, the technology is uh, subject to, to yeah, medical device regulations. So you can be quite sure that if it says uh, 38.5 degrees, that it's this value. Okay. Uh, if uh, uh, so, uh, and we, we can consider this. So, and then we have some other information pieces, so to say. Where we not cannot sure. So, for instance, or for instance, if there's uh, quite that are not uh, captured by by sensors, for instance, if you think about structured questionnaires uh, for the patient or uh, pain scores. So, uh, if you ask, if you get asked as a patient, so uh, please indicate your your pain on a scale from one to ten, uh, and then the patient says, yeah, something between five and seven or something like, yeah, okay, then. Uh, uh, from this, you already get a, a kind of uncertainty. 
Yeah, and then you, we we uh, uh, incorporate this uncertainty uh, by uh, using some um, technologies available uh, that can uh, uh, that we can calculate it. For instance, uh, Bayesian networks uh, is one of the technologies uh, we explored uh, to to include uh, this uh, let's say uncertainties or this uh, not not fully one hundred percent. Certainty, uh, but there are other technologies uh, we are currently exploring uh, that are able to deal with uh, incomplete information that are able to incorporate uh, reconstructed information. Uh, this is also something. Uh, I mean, if you have uh, uh, three values and one is missing, and you know the let's say the, the relation of these three values, you can think about reconstructing the third one that is missing. Uh, these are strategies, uh, or simply. Uh, you have uh, different cross checks from the from the clinical point of view that say okay uh, uh, if you don't have this value you can uh, use another strategy to 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 make your decision thank you right we still have four minutes any other question um, from from yeah. You know, I haven't seen it again. Uh, if not, I still have a, a question concerning um, data storage. Um, so, uh, so for relational database, do you use the commercial one or just use, for example, for SQL to to collect all the data? That is. I have to admit, I have to ask the PhD students for this. I see, okay. <laughs> I know that they try different right. databases okay. on which they are currently using. I'm, I'm not able to answer now. Okay, yeah, <laughs> right. Because uh, what we have been doing now at Casus as well, so we use relational database, um, but we extract transfer and loading for many uh, uh, sources to, to, to analyze the COVID situation in Saxon and Czech and, and Poland. So okay. therefore, yeah. Ah, next, we have two uh, more questions. The first is from Michael Hecht, probably. Yeah, please. Hi, yeah, thanks for the, for the amazing talk. Just a short question for curiosity. Um, <clears throat> um, my question is whether in some of the subroutines you, you have to address um, some algebraic um, problem solving or optimization technique is used, or more precisely, the notion of Charybdis basis. Does it occur? Maybe yeah, there is this classic problem: if you have um, an object, a three D uh, object, which you uh, have pictures from several positions, and you want to reconstruct that, then this relates back to a classic mathematical uh, mm -hmm. problem we are working on. And I just ask whether this somehow occurs here in this project somewhere. So uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're talking about uh, error propagation challenge? Somehow, um, but, but mostly it's um, about um, 3D um, object reconstruction from several um, pictures you take out of several positions. So you have a camera which makes uh, yeah. pictures from several positions and out of that you want to reconstruct a 3D object. Um, my question is whether such a problem is somehow a subroutine here. Uh, not for the digital twin. Uh, of course, we have it uh, for if uh, we, we apply the digital twin for therapy support. For instance, if you, uh, I, I showed you one of the, the, the video sequences for the, for the intelligent operating room that, for instance, if you insert an endoscope inside of the patient's nose, Yes. And you go too deep, uh, mm -hmm. then you have uh, a danger to end up in the in, in the brainstem. Exactly. And shortly before, uh, if it's detected that the instrument is near to the to the thin bone wall that protects the brain scan, then automatically the surgeon gets uh, the position of this uh, tool, and uh, uh, so that he knows. Okay, uh, now I need to be aware. And there, of course, if you have a reconstructing error. Of the of your virtual model of the of yes. the patient uh, that deviates from the physical patient, then you have of course a problem. Uh, but usually these uh, measurement systems are very reliable, 
So if we use uh, infrared based uh, registration, so we have 0.1 millimeter uh, uh, accuracy. So it's uh, something that is uh, really, really established in the medical domain, let's say since 10, 15 years. Uh, and uh, so we, yeah, we have high trust in this. Okay, so you, so I mean, I'm sorry, it's just really just for curiosity, you don't create a 3D uh, model of the nodes on the fly or something. No, 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 no. This is, uh, no. also takes too much <laughs> computation time. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. If, if, if we see uh, the necessity for this, uh, yes. and if the clinician, the clinician says, okay, please, uh, 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 this is for me now part of my standard operating procedure that to review this 3D model or whatever, uh, yeah. uh, then we process it before he actually actually needs it. Okay, I see. Yeah, I see. so about uh, uh, we, we don't do it on the fly. If he says, now please give me all joint, uh, whatever amount of gigabyte information, image <laughs> information and create me a model on the fly. Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, probably last uh, last question before the coffee break uh, from Ma Korza Tabogdan, please. So hello, thank you for a very, very nice talk, very interesting talk. I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, how far do you go like with integrating omics data, like genomics, proteomics? Do you try to do it and to which extent? Yeah, we, we include them. We are currently on including them uh, for the tumor board decision. Of course, there's a currently the, the let's say the the, the, the upcoming uh, uh, topic. Uh, it's called the molecular tumor board, uh, where you also uh, consider more and more these uh, kind of information in your decision making process, and uh, we work on the in the, in the inclusion of this data. And basically, you, you are applying machine learning tools mainly, or you, you have told about like uh, Bayesian networks, which are statistical tools. So um, I just wonder how much of statistical tools, like dimensionality reduction tools, do you use? Uh, we use uh, the, the, uh, mainly the, uh, the machine learning work okay. currently. So we explore the Bayesian networks in, in, in the past. Uh, with quite ex extensive amount of uh, of work, uh, but we are now more focusing on machine learning. Thank you. Right, uh, it's very fascinating discussion, uh, but sadly that uh, time is going to end. We're coming now to the coffee break. So thank you very much, Professor Neumuth, for the presentation, for the fascinating presentation.